in the ruins of libraries. At some point, he decided to read Shakespeare, the plays, the sonnets, the interminable mass of scholarship. By that time, most of the taller buildings, even the sturdiest ones, had collapsed. So he lived only in structures of 10 stories or fewer, even those with the decaying steel and the roofs that grew lopsided as the foundations sank into the ground had to be maintained. A task to which he devoted a good five hours each day, hammering, welding, scraping away mold and rust. He spent the rest of the day reading. It was a good routine. He knew it was good because it had lasted him for at least 700 years. There had been difficult periods, of course. There had been the time when he realized that everything he'd read during the previous four decades, he'd forgotten. He had killed himself hundreds of times then. There had been the time he had not been able to stop thinking about the day when the Earth would give way to empty and everlasting outer space, in which he would asphyxiate again and again. He had built himself a raft and drifted around the oceans for years then, staring into the horizon and letting his mind sink into blank abysses. It was true, he would always forget. Even as he absorbed more information one day, he was forgetting things he had learned 100 or even 10 or two years ago. Yet he only had to look out the window at trees that grew and collapsed and grew again like a tide, at columns of wood and stone that desiccated alike in the wake of the centuries, to see that the contents of his mind were the only thing worth reinforcing. At first only novels had interested him. The futility of practical knowledge, of non-fiction, had been cleared immediately. He would never die. And yet each fact he might gather from a biography, or even say, the history of a given geologic span, was rooted to a particular period and would recede over time to its vanishing point. Facts drifted away, but fiction was part of you. He hoped with fiction to imbue himself with a halo of humanist knowledge and somehow float away into an afterlife. He started with Austin whose complete work he spent through in a year, the scholarship in 15. From Austin, he skipped Twain and Melville and Hemingway. After Hemingway, he paused for several years to learn French and then read Hugo for more than 100 years. <laughs> At last, he returned to English and James, who at 125 years took the longest of all. After nearly 500 years of reading, he decided not seeing then the truly vast expanse of time that awaited to undertake all of Shakespeare. Undaunted, he read for 100 years, then 200 years, before long, 400 years. He had been reading Shakespeare alone for nearly 700 years, when one day he looked up from a volume of critical essays on The Tempest and decided that he was sick of the man and his old-fashioned style. To clear his mind, he set off to walk across to Russia to the Kamchatka Peninsula. It was a long journey, and illness along the way caused him to die several times. Each time, he simply awoke in the spot where he had last slept, healthy once again. In this manner, he progressed across the boggy and featureless Siberian landscape. How short-sighted had he been to read solely fiction? Fiction, too with its petty concerns for the lives of people and their interactions, had long ago ceased to have meaning. It was knowledge for its own sake that he really needed. Only something more elemental, more removed from humanity and yet central to himself and the fact of his existence, that defied mortality and yet clung like alcohol to his skin. This may yet bestow on him some kind of enlightenment. This thing could only be poetry. He began with Chaucer, then Don, Keats, Byron, Blake, Eliot, Auden, Plath. After 1,000 years, he sailed to America to read Dickinson, Longfellow, Whitman, Cummings, Frost, Bishop, Rich. He sailed to China and spent 25 years learning Mandarin. <laughs> then read Li Bai by Jui, Du Fu, Guo Qi, Hu Yuan, Shooting. One thousand more years passed. He spent a year restoring a sailboat for a trip to Europe, and the French, Dutch, Italian, 
Spanish, Russian and Germanic greats, then stopped. He wrapped a foot in the rigging, set his elbow on his knee and his chin in his hand, and looked out at the Pacific Ocean, where the sun bled into a harbour. There had been some happy times during the days he had read poetry. He had bedded down for a decade at the penthouse suite in the Burj Al Arab in Dubai. He had brought an ice cream factory back online and dived into a vat of orange sherbet. But mostly there had been dark times. Poetry had not helped him to accept immortality. It had helped him to sense it even more acutely. He craved his death as if it were a flavour he could taste on his tongue or a long-lost memory he was close to recapturing. He had dived into canyons. He had fumigated himself. He had jumped from wharfs into frozen oceans. He had waded out into deserts to drown in heat and misery. He would read non-fiction. He had got it all wrong. To try to distance himself from the world as he had once known it, even as time accomplished the task for him, this was hopeless. His salvation could only be in total immersion in facts. Book by book, he would piece humanity back together. But by now, it was almost too late. Many of the world's libraries had collapsed, and many of its books were sold. They crumbled beneath his fingers or fell from the spine when he lifted them. He read without method or direction. Sometimes he stuck to a system for as long as several years in a row. He would work his way along chronologically, he decided one year, or he would progress topic by topic, he decided another year, beginning with philosophy. But this approach soon devolved into progression by the alphabet, which was almost as good as no system at all. Moreover, there was still no solution to the problem of an imperfect memory. Images, impressions, sensations, these would remain in his brain in diminishing forms for eternity. But hard facts evaporated in mere years. Before long, there was no way to remember what he had read and what he hadn't. And yet he knew that he must continue. There was nothing else. Soon most of what he read was scraps of withered paper collected from the ruins of libraries. He gathered them up in his fists each morning and sat under a tree to pour over them. As the scraps broke apart into smaller and smaller pieces, his ability to distinguish between one sentence and the next, one word and the next, drifted away. Until finally, he was no longer able to tell which language was which. Still, he continued his routine, crouched in the shade of a tree where he ate and slept, searching for the words he'd once had. Thank you.